Welcome to another episode of First Step, where we get industry professionals, leaders in their fields, to share with us the steps they took to get us, or get them rather, to where they are today. And with us, we have a lovely guest, a dear person who I am so glad to be able to share in this little moment of inspiration with you guys with, um, the lovely Dr. Jennifer Rose. She is a uh, doctor in gerontology. I hope I'm not getting the whole thing correct. Right? Correct. Um, she also is a part time lecturer at UWE and a former director in the Department of Aging at the Ministry of Social Development. I am also hoping I get that right, Auntie Jenny. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I really am so glad you know you made the time to come on here and, and share with us um, your journey and um, how it, it began in your present field, which you have since formally, I guess, retired from, but you're still actively involved in. Um, but so, I, um, Auntie Jenny, I just want to get a little background as to you coming up. I always like to start from the, the infancy stages, right? Mm -hmm. or, or I would say the budding woman stage to get an idea of what the mind is and what would have led you to where you are now as the woman <laughs> sure and a pleasant morning to all who are viewing and listening to me it is it really is a journey eh? mm -hmm. and um as you had already mentioned and let them know what well you call the word gerontology and some people are like gero who yes mm -hmm. i know when you hear gero as a prefix to anything you know you're dealing with the elders mm -hmm. and so when anyone, while I was studying, you know, and collecting data and, and what have you, persons would ask me occasionally, well, what brought you into this field? You know, and I say, well, I didn't choose aging. Aging chose me. Mm. And um, when I started the whole, what would have been the, the, the confluence of all the streams that were and still are responsible for the guidance and the push towards this, it, um, it made sense because I am the last of nine children. Mm. And so when I was born, my father was 46, my mom was 40. Wow. So I would have been labeled old people child back <laughs> in those days, right. old people child, good. And uh, so by the time I came into the earth plane, as they call it, mm. My eldest sibling was 18, and then it came down the train. So you had a one 18, 17, 16, 15, follow? Right. And so being nine, which is an odd number, it also means that the other eight were coupled. So whenever they had to go out or whatever, they got went either as a group or right. they were coupled. So here was I in the odd number nine and right. last. Right. So, and then I came five years after number eight. Mm. So it means there was a gap. And as my mom told me, well, when I was able to understand years later, she didn't even know she was pregnant with me. And um, no sign. And she wasn't even, um, you know, showing right. yet. Oh. But she was just feeling strange. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she said, let her go to the doctor. And the doctor said, well, you have a growth. And she was livid because in those days, to get any surgery or any operation to remove this, you had to go to England, which he told her. Oh. <laughs> and she put by boat, don't forget, uh -huh. by boat, because they used to have these big steamers coming in at the port. Right. And she was, there's no way. And it worried her, but um, some teachers who she used to board, because that was the order of the day. We lived in Takarigua then, which is considered country then. At that time, right. At that time. And um, she, they encouraged her to get a second opinion. And when she did, that's when the other doctor said, no, it's not a growth. It's a living growth. <laughs> And she said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you're pregnant. She said, impossible he said you're pregnant so you see how i started in other words i had a mission from way way back definitely 
to come here to do something, mm -hmm. you know. And my father, on the other hand, he was an educator all of his life. I'm right. um, a very proud black man, you know. And um, so education had, had always been his watchword. Right. Um, knowledge is power. And, and remember, both of them were born in like World War I era. So he was 1907 and she was 1912. Wow, okay. So they experienced two wars. And as a result of which, um, the, the ethos they came out of was one of colonialism. And then um, her mother, her mother um, lived with us in the household. So mm -hmm. it was interesting to see how they operated and, and, and managed the household because mm -hmm. my grandmother was the matriarch. Daddy was the patriarch. There was no confusion of roles. Right. And there was no bouncing up of, of um, crossing boundaries because he, know he, he knows he married my mother. Right. She dealt with the cooking and the roles and whatever. If granny had to assist by the time daddy came home, you just see granny make her exit and she goes into her room. Oh. You know, they would chat a little, but she didn't dominate. Right. And granny kind of took me under her wing just like that, you know, and she would every evening at about 6.30, because she had, she was um, Bajan mm -hmm. and um, wrinkled one tooth. <laughs> and she had this long silver hair that she used to stroke, you know, while she's um, seeing or, or getting ready to, to prepare for her evening prayer. And I would sit at her feet mm -hmm. at, on a little pier. Mm -hmm. And she had this book of leaves. I mean, the daily prayers were in leaves. She had it bound with a, like a twine. And she would read the daily prayer of the day. And then she will go into giving me certain um, bits of her chapters of her life in Barbados. Mm. And she was born in 1896. Wow. And so little did I know then I was getting oral history. So here is what, um, it, and I'm saying this in a context, mm -hmm. because Granny, as I knew her all of my life, was with silver hair wrinkled cheeks she had these twinkles at her even um, crow's feet as they say at her eyes and almost always looked as if she was smiling right. and um when you understand now that a grandmother is 35 in today's world mm -hmm. it means the labels seem to be totally switched switched up right yeah, because when anybody hears granny, you think of old, wrinkled, gnarled, but that's not so now. Mm. So I had that privilege of having in the household a granny, a true granny. And little did I know that it was oral history she was giving me because it came through like a story. Right, right. You know, when the tram cars, how they used to move for transport and when her transition over to Trinidad with um, where she had mama. I think mama was born in, in, in my mama. She was born in Barbados, but she never knew her father because at that time, the, the men, a lot of the men in the, those islands went across to help build the Panama Canal. The, uh, you follow? Right. And so this was history. Mm. And, and so I didn't get a lot of this from in a book. I got it from her, you know. Mm. So there is where the seeds Applied. of aging began. Right. Okay. The whole, and then having parents that were already old, they were not practicing on me parenting. Right. They were already very okura with it. The only difference is that by the time they got to me, and maybe the two before me, the rules of engagement had to change. <laughs> because <laughs> it was a whole different generation. Right, right. But daddy was the patriarch, and you had to know from that the respect. And he was very clear as an educator mm -hmm. what he wanted for his children. All mm -hmm. nine, mine, you as a headmaster, his salary was $4. Eh? <laughs> and um, he never had a loan, didn't take a loan to raise us because mm -hmm. everything at that time was manual. You know, so Mama showed us how to sew mm -hmm. and cook. Mm -hmm. 
So those were the basic rudiments of the stages coming up, coming up and yeah. that was their role. Wow. So Grammy's influence had a major impact on me, yeah. um, both the optic of seeing her and then listening to her. And then daddy was um, an orator mm -hmm. and he too would, um, he used to judge debates in schools. Oh, okay. And um, I never went to hear any of it because I was little, you know. But at the same time, I was accustomed to growing with someone who spoke very clearly, um, articulation, elocution on point. Right. He, he was one where speak when spoken to, answer when called, as we used to term it, because he just wasn't talk, 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 talk. Right. Mama was the one now that was more engaging because she now was a householder. But they balance the energies very well. You I, see? I, I found and it I, very, I found yeah. it very interesting. Just, just to interject one, no, little, I found you, it you, very you, interesting, you, the dynamic between your dad and yeah. your grandmother. Yes, would have been, as you said, the matriarch in the household, sure. and she would have also been a leader in her own right. In her own way, correct. But because she, and remember, she would have been a single parent oh, raising right. when, the, when her husband died. But I found it so interesting that she knew her role. And when your dad came in, she wouldn't try to, she knew her position at that point and exactly. give him his space to do his thing as well. Exactly. You know, and not um, butting into the conversations that right. they have, maybe about managing the home or the children or whatever. Right. But she had a quiet, um, what, what I came to see you know, sometimes when they show these black movies and sometimes they go back to like um, in Africa or the southern part of America, the, what they call the Mississippi Delta area. Right. And you would always hear them talk of the, the, the mama. They would always have like in the communities a big mama. Right. And that mama was not meaning she was a gossiper and always in everybody's business, but she observed. Mm. She, and even in, uh, um, in colonial times, her, her presence was so powerful because when you get into slavery and, and so, you had the house and the field um, mm -hmm. slaves. Mm -hmm. And those who were in the household with the white colonials, they would sometimes even nurse the babies of the white women. Oh. But their role, because I saw this as a player enacted, mm -hmm. and that mama... She never spoke for the entire play, but you knew how powerful her role was because she used to see like the dalias between the husband um, raping some of the slave girls, yet coming home to his white wife, who suspected what was going on but had no voice. Hmm. So that mama, that black mama, understood her subservient role and, and was able to empathize at a much deeper level to, to know they were both in silent roles, but for different, from different reasons. Right, I got you. You, I you got, got it? Yeah, I so got it is that synergy that brought it, and this is what you have to see in the play being acted out. Right. So that when the white wife was wandering, and sometimes he would beat her, hmm. you know, and it was the big mama the black mama, who they're supposed to hate her. Right. She was the one that used to cradle her. Wow. And all the children went to her. So that's the role of the matriarch. Right. So you had, and you had that first hand in a Caribbean. I, I would, yes, in a, exactly. In a Caribbean, you can remember we were a colony too. Right, exactly. And so what was interesting though, that in raising us, and in nurturing all of us, there was no spoiled child. You know, they had this, uh, you are the last, so you're spoiled. We didn't have that. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> and daddy was very clear in laying down what he would like his children to be. And it is only now as an adult, you know, and looking back, I realized the, he was what you will term eclectic in terms of having various interests yes. in, in a lot of because mm -hmm. he read every night he read until 2 a.m and i guess that's why so you and i saw it exactly yeah, you would have taken that up whole exactly. right. 
because mm -hmm. he didn't show that reading was a problem. Mm -hmm. So therefore, and then having the older siblings, which is what, of course, they told me the, all of this years after, they would put me when they are doing their homework, I would sit in the middle of them on the table that they were doing the homework on. Right. So that I would imitate when I see them reading, I would do the same with a little book they would give me. <laughs> you follow? Even right, if you upside down, I would be imitating. Right. Because I'm saying, and then when they were writing, they would give me a piece of paper and I would be writing like them. So right. they told me, I think I started writing cursive between separate letters. Oh, Papa. Four separate letters <laughs> because I was imitating them. So. Mm. It, it goes to show the importance of that grounding in the home. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you, you embark on your first, first community. Right. And, I, and the one other sentence I would say from that is, that's why it, it, it kind of hurt me in a way where, because of the demographic, how society has moved from extended families to nuclear and now even single headed right so that dynamic some of them don't even know what they don't know because they have never been in it so that now mm -hmm. we're in this more affluent society and you know and the largesse and women being in control more in control of their bodies where families now are one or two and when you look at the, the families that have one or two as, as planned families, right. they, they have the intellectual, they are the ones with the intellectual capital and the resources, not necessarily millionaires, mm -hmm. to really raise and nurture a family in terms of from that aspect. Right. But what we see now that there is a negative correlation between the higher the education of the woman, the less children they will have. It, it goes to, it, it, I agree. It, it, I you agree. Would understand? Yes, and, I agree. and as a result, over time, well, of course, when feminism hit the, 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 the whole matrix in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and, and as it is said, they throw out baby and bad water, then the woman more so left the home even more than the ones who started to do so in my parents' age, you know, right. coming to the end of their era. Right. So, so even in listening to one of your previous podcasts, mm -hmm. I realized that those of us who are in our 60s are historians. Indeed. We yeah. are. <laughs> so that what we would be kicking over, you remember when TV was so and so and the radio that had two stations and whatever, that's history. Right, it is. It is. You know, because when I speak with some young people that we were in this little house in Takarigua and um, the bathroom outside, and they would be like, they would say, one bathroom you all had? And I say, yes. <laughs> and nobody was late for school or work. Wow. Because you had to understand order. So, and that's why I told them again, in order, because we had to travel. Eh? Right. All of us, our schooling was in Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. And we travel by the train. Mm -hmm. So some of I'm them asked, where, where the train? I say, yes, the train would pass through Orange, where Orange Grove and all those places where the train passed there. Wow. And we had to get the train to get into school, you know, and be on time. So to be on time, to even have your bath and have breakfast before you leave, it meant you had to know what time you should be going to sleep the night before. <laughs> <laughs> You understand? Yes, it does. And that's how daddy had a ground rule. You had to go in your bed at night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now fast tracking a bit as your boy yes. going into school now and you being a, a, a hilarion. Yes? <laughs> um, and, and I know you're saying that with, um, you know, you make sure you swallow. <laughs> yeah, I had, to, I had to make sure I get it right. <laughs> I didn't want any other hilarions come on. Jump on <laughs> <laughs> but yes, keep going. But you now going into secondary school and now being exposed to a different um, set of ideologies and, and approaches in, in conjunction with you being exposed to your home from mama and your dad and your mother itself. How did that influence your, your, your development? And, and right. Well, I'm glad you brought that in because at the time, <clears throat> Bishop Anstey Junior School was in the compound of where the high school is, you know, on the part on, on Chancery Lane. Right. 
Nat's entrance was the junior school. And what maybe you didn't know is that I entered from the age of five. Oh, so I started okay. in Bishop Anstey. Okay. It wasn't kindergarten. It mm -hmm. was what they would call um, the junior school, preschool. Mm -hmm. And so I was in Bishop Anstey compound at Abercrombie Street there from the age of five until I left at 19. Wow. So I was totally... Well seasoned. Well seasoned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well -seasoned. Mm -hmm. And what you, I listened to what you said in posing your question. And that's why I opened by saying it's a whole confluence of streams of different, of, of the influences that make this being mm. that I have become because we were under British teachers. Wow. The majority of the, 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 the teacher teaching staff were from England. So these are white, white. British, correct is right. What was also very significant and everything I'm saying, I'm saying in a context leading up to where we're going to end. Eh? Mm -hmm. They were all spinsters. They were all spinsters. It didn't mean they were anti anybody. Eh? Mm -hmm. This is who they were. So again, the optic. Right. Not that we wanted to be white. When, and, and there was this thing, this saying, we, we hear in this more and more recently where um, bishops is a black school. We didn't know about that then mm -hmm. because we had a lot of whites. We had Chinese. We had Indian. We had black. It was a whole mix of every race, mm -hmm. you know? And we didn't have the word prestige either, that we were in a prestige school. Okay. But what was interesting is that my, all my siblings, all my sisters, they went to Bishop Anstey. Right. And because of their performance as well as their achievements, Miss Sutherland, who was the principal when I got in, okay. And, and daddy, because he's a teacher too, right. always took an interest and had meetings with her. I'm not sure if they had a robust PTA at the time, eh? mm -hmm. but um, the Ms. Sutherland got to know parents of the children that attended. Mm -hmm. So when, when the, the first three of my siblings, they were all in Bishop Ansi together. Right. So when they were ready to graduate and leave, Miss Sutherland called daddy and asked if he had any more girls. <laughs> wow. And there was one again before me. Mm -hmm. So she was next in line. Nine. And okay. he went in. And then after she left, I then was, the, and she asked it again. And I was the last one, you see? Mm -hmm. But you just had to do a little entrance test, as they call it. Mm -hmm. and, and I got in. So from the age of five. And what these Britishers did they didn't just teach from an academic. You had to do sport. You had to play. In other words, play was an intrinsic part of the curriculum. Right. And the yard where you now see the laboratory and where we have the all-inclusive fet and the hall, and that wasn't there. Right. All of that was yard. And it was fruit trees, sapodilla, pump, I mean, you name it. Oh. There were fruit trees, and I remember the, the, specifically there was a tall, dark teacher. I mean, she was like a, now that I know Miss Edwards was her name, she was pencil thinner, mm -hmm. but her height was significant because she was about 5'11 or 5'10. Mm -hmm. And when she taught, she taught us like a griot. She would take us outside under the sapodilla tree, and we, these are us who in little, we were all like six or right. seven, right. and we're in a circle around her, which is a very Afrocentric approach of, right. um, of, 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 of learning. Yes. And how they express, you would always see them in circles because that meant there was no beginning and no end. Mm. And so there was no hierarchy when you sit in a circle. You got it? Mm -hmm. And so Miss Edwards would not, would not just give us the story. She used to teach us folklore. And she would enact the characters, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Nancy, and, and, and look at how I am now, an old woman, as they would call me. And I remember that as graphically as if it was yesterday. I don't know what became of Miss Edwards, but she was a, a, an embodiment of like a Louise Bennett. Wow. And we would just be sitting there in awe 
listening to her, you know, describe these characters and whatever. And so we look forward to those classes. We have to do um, netball and all these things. And then you had to also do embroidery, they used to call it, and wow. sewing, and cookery. So you realize now the rudiments you got in the home, you now had to get, and this is when I had reached all like about the age of 11, well, 11 was self, um, common entrance. Mm -hmm. But coming through between the age of five and 11, we had to sit in a particular way before we wrote. Oh. So that you sat straight, mm -hmm. you didn't sit in how the angle of the book was on the table where you're lying down and writing. Right. And we used to have to do calligraphy with an italic pen. So all the bishopians, as I call us, who were in that era, we write almost alike. Wow. Because of how British, how it was, we were taught. Yeah, the influence. And the influence. And when black power entered, in 1970, between 69 70, and 70, because right. I remember taking my first natural at 69 in 69. Okay. Um, based on the readings and what was happening in America, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. the literature and whatever. But you remember, don't forget, I was strict father, so I'm not marching anywhere. Right. I am in school. I never, I never was in the march. But with that 70 coming in, they ran all British teachers from all these schools because other high schools had them as well. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to leave and we kind of nationalize what we should be looking like. You know, we should right. be looking and seeing people. So the, after Miss Sutherland left and Miss Ernie uh, Wilmot and a whole um, heap of them, in came Miss Sherlan mm. and she was our first black headmistress. They all had S. They all started with S as their surnames, which okay. was Stevens and Shrewsbury, Sutherland, and then Sheila. Right. And Miss Sheila was a, a southerner. She was an apps girl. Okay. And she had been living in Tanzania where she was teaching and whatever. So when she repatriated to Trinidad, she went back down to South to Naps. Mm -hmm. And they called her and invited her to teach because they needed a principal. Oh. And so Miss Sheila again was a spinster. And so here we are seeing a woman looking like us, mm -hmm. we who are darker than blue, as they call us. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing a principal looking like us, very educated, traveled. Mm -hmm. And what did Ms. Sheldon do in 1970? She installed, she um, commissioned Ralph and Vera Bainey, who were sculptors, internationally right. known but locally born, to uh, um, establish a mosaic in the chapel of Bishop Anstey with a black Christ. Wow. And that is still there today. Hey, yeah. Well, I need not tell you. Back <laughs> and all time. Back hmm. and all time. Because hmm. it's, a, it's a Jesus with an afro in a dashiki with his hands, just how Christ would have had his hands, you know, when he was walking on water. Wow. And that's what we looked at. That's what we saw. We saw it actually built by brick, by because it was a mosaic. A mosaic. Mm -hmm. Ask a question. I, I, I'm trying to establish now that contrast in, in mindset because, you know, coming out of this heavily British influence style of education, mm -hmm. now to see someone looking like yourself and, and in the era of the Black Power movement, how did that then tweak well, your mind and your it, outlook on things? Yeah, well, what I had to, it was a, a kind of, what maybe, a culture shock. That's the correct thing. Mm -hmm. Because when I sat common entrance from in Bishop Skirt, because we came to the junior mm -hmm. school, and entered now Form 1, which was across the way now, going on to now the, the big school, the, the right. senior school. Right. We had a real culture shock. Now, I can't speak on the others, how it impacted them, but I can speak about me. What is in today's term called bullying? We were bullied by the new entrants who passed from Lavantel, Belmont, oh. Um, yeah. you name it, they came in. Even though, and I'm not, we're not stigmatizing here, mm -hmm. but are using everything in context. Mm -hmm. Because this common entrance, that's why it was called that, it opened up 
that anybody who can pass this particular level of, of, of entrance exam right. is qualified. To attend. To, and don't forget, Eric Williams made education free. So when my other siblings, my older siblings used to have to pay, they used to have to pay for schooling, you know. Remember what I told you my salary was? Eh? Four dollars. Right. So you can imagine their ethos was cut, contrive, and conserve mm -hmm. and make things meet. They used to have what is still the building there by um, Shakan and um, um, Queen Street building and loan. That was where our parents used to go. And they also ran Susu, not Pyramid, not, yeah, not, not DSS. And no, yeah, right. it was Susu. Right. And I have, to, I have to introduce that point there because that is what supplemented the households. Susu and the other thing was friendly society. Who's this? 20, 20, friendly societies? Yes, they, they still have them. 25% of Trinidad and Tobago, in terms of families, were members of the Friendly Society. This is where they contributed. And I think the among them was eight pleas per year. And you used to get dividends, eh? Right. Where they would um, congregate, just as you say, Friendly Society. You know how the cooperatives operate? Right, yes. And these were, and the, the East Indians had their own. Mm -hmm. and the afro it came, all this came out from the freed slaves mm -hmm. it's the freed slaves that started the susu as we know it that was their way of of their bank mm -hmm. i remember back in their day they battered with salt and then battered with um the curry shell before they came into money mm -hmm. but all is this is the history that i'm learning as i go along and that was part of the history that we were taught in mm -hmm. bishop Amsty, you know so when now common entrance came and we transitioned from junior school with the British and the, 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 all the different idiosyncrasies that we learned in the detail that they gave us as I just told you how you sat, how you ate. And even when we ate in the dining hall, not everybody was at the dining hall because you had to pay to be there. I wasn't, but I used to laugh at some of them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you had to only eat a portion, which was rationed, and you, had to, you didn't have juice. You had water right. with one block of ice, and the glass of water was full. So we used to laugh at them and say, we, we, we surely are still hungry, you know? And, and, and the dessert, mm -hmm. and they had to pray, and everything was kind of like boom, 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 you know? Mm -hmm regimented yeah but yet and so we used to look at those girls in that way because quite a number of the girls who grew with us through um junior school into senior they were like children eric williams daughter was there erica okay and you had ambassadors most of the ambassadors children came there as well whether from jamaica um what is now caricom wherever so they came from a different class right we who travel from by train from Tanapuna, um, we were country. Right. <laughs> so these others on a weekend used to go down the islands. We didn't know where that was. They didn't know where we going. But yet, Rouse, coming from a family with nine, mm -hmm. every morning I reached the school, my desk would be surrounded because they know I have something to talk about <laughs> that happened in the house. Right. And I never failed them, eh? Right. So, and I'm saying this to, 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 let, to give you a cue to where I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. So they look forward to that because there's the ones with the upper class. Right. They didn't have that, that communication. I know. And, mm -hmm. and what a, a busy household because many of them, they were the only child. Uh, or they had like a brother uh, and therefore they had the protocols even when the homes that they lived in right. we just went home you play in the yard you get brew you get um bitten by well sting as we call it mm -hmm. with jack spania because right. we had a wild august vacation we didn't know about summer mm -hmm. <laughs> summer yeah, now coming summer i don't know where this come from yeah, but you. we just know it was august vacation mm -hmm. 
So when we start common entrance and now crossover, right? With this new mix, me, ay, 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 ay. those from Lavantil Belmont used to be asking, and we all you talking, we all you well, why all you talking? So this is how they're asking us, eh? and they, we had a, a significant number of of um, students and bishops came from Tobago. Okay. A good bit, and you know, Tobago don't put on no nothing. Accent. Their mm. accent is pure Yoruba. Right. So when they say my mother do so so so, you know it's their mother. M U D D E R. <laughs> but what was interesting, they were brilliant in terms of winning the scholarships. Because bishops and QRC were ranking in the most scholarships that used to come oh, out right. every Island, year. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. That was what was significant. So we knew Tobago had a significant part to play in all the acumen that bishops um, could boast of right. back in those days. Right. And these, so I wonder, so we didn't know, we didn't know that we had an accent clearly influenced by the British teachers. Right. And they were like, you'll talk properly now where you come from and prep and that bothered me because, you know, we didn't want, now that black power now start to surge now right. later on, we didn't want to sound white. Right. You got it? So yes. that's coming into the, the, I the, got it. the statement you made. How right. did we deal with that? Mm-hmm. That was, well, in, in, in big, big word terms, that was cataclysmic for many of us. Mm-hmm. So we used to huddle together. Because we knew how we the, the grounding we got and how we were groomed, but at the same time, we are now entering now this whole other um, high school. But you know who used to protect us and who were what you call our tomato sticks? Mm-hmm. We used to call them the big girls. Uh. Those were the ones in sixth form. Right, who would the have form. come up through the system as well. That's it. That's right. it. You follow? And what was also very significant, and I'm saying all of this because of the position I am in, I could have easily juxtaposed them and now mm-hmm. the big girls who were in upper five, um, upper five, lower six, and upper six. Mm-hmm. They were the same height and size as they were as women. And I'm saying this to say, many of them were like five foot seven five foot eight and they wore long skirts like by the calf mm-hmm. so they yeah. are essentially women yeah in and sleep. when i see this is now in the last 10 years or more mm-hmm. the children who are now passing what was S- uh, what is now sea mm-hmm. These are these children looking like what we were at five and seven and yeah, ten. They look babyish though. It's true. They look, yeah, they look they very. Little. They have no awareness as well. It. Seems very little. That's it. Yeah. Because yeah. they didn't have this community in the house. Mm. They both parents working. Mm-hmm. Granny might be living away from them or whatever and remember we have this cultural mix in trinidad eh? the east indians always have their respect granny and grandpa right and they would live close Mm -hmm. and that's why you have these enclaves and pockets of like el dorado um central where granny when they go down by the river is the whole family Mm -hmm. you see it up to now Mm -hmm. so their cultural influence coming from india has remained with them and they, they will practice the puja and the lota and the, all the different things in the yard and whatever. They grew up seeing that. We didn't have that experience. So, you know, you had to respect the differences. I got you. But what we also had in Bishop Ansi now were the more upper class East Indians in the school. Those who now live in Cascade mm. and St. Anne's. You see where I'm going? Mm-hmm. And so they were, they were different. They were different. And even what they brought to school to eat. And this is really interesting, you know, because the ones who were in the, the upper class that I told you about that came through junior and upper, they would come with these sandwiches with all the edges cut off. Papa. So it's just white bread, you know, mm-hmm. like it manicured. And when we come with our homemade bread, bread. the slice alone, <laughs> like one the, slice, like the whole sandwich. <laughs> 
You understand? Yeah. And we would see them eyeing our things. Eh? But we know, oh God, and don't ask for those from Tobago. You could tell their own was need flour because that's how we didn't just buy bread. Right. And then well, gradually as we got older, mama started cooking meals for me to take to school in your right. little area, you know. But that is an interesting, that's an interesting point you brought in there, how we made that transition. It wasn't easy. Yeah, I think. It I was think. not easy. So, so now you, you go into secondary school right. and having to deal with the gauntlet of the dynamics and the new mindset because there's a whole cultural shift happening as well right. at that time. Um, you and know, I, I mentioned an, an in, we, independence came because when I was five, when I entered, we weren't independent yet. You right, know. Independent right. came at 62. That's you right. Know, remember. Good. So it was all around like 62, 63, 64. I now going into the big school. Right. So, so, so now you haven't um, gone through secondary school. Let's to mm -hmm. fast track a little bit now. Sure. And I guess going through the little black power movement started right. to bring in your fro and yeah. and whatnot mm -hmm. um how then was that move into womanness now and becoming we used to now what is another indicate what was what i still look back on mm -hmm. and reflect on in our home you would never hear daddy speak of black negro Indian, coolie, right. never heard that vocabulary. Clearly, what I would attribute to him in his, uh, in his style of nurturing us was uh, he was very pro-black, but not anti-anybody. Uh, <laughs> that you. is how I would describe him, mm -hmm. because he taught everybody. Because the amount of East Indians used to come home to me and, and say, Doc, um, you know, Mr. Rouse, we want a recommendation. Those were people he taught. And then he was um, in Tobago for some years. So Victor Bruce and a whole lot of people who, have, who made it in substantive were his pupils. Mm -hmm. You follow? So he, you, it, all I could describe it as his uh, his um um his ability you yeah, are not using heavy words like indoctrination mm -hmm. forget that mm -hmm. it and michelin in bishops because remember getting it in two for right, two ways right, eh? right it was the only word i will use it was subliminal you see how advertisements would be on the tv and affect your taste mm -hmm. um your choices mm -hmm. that was their subtle it was subtle just like how she did with the black Christ in the chapel. She didn't come and ask us, you know, for right. our consultation. She did it. Mm -hmm. And so that we will know other. That was her way of introducing other. I got you. But never come in with any jargon of, of resistance and anti and whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm also saying this in the context. When the black power movement began to, to, to have effect, we got it from outside. Right. So there was a lot of literature, even in the Caribbean with Walter Rodney, grounding with my brothers and so little booklets. Mm -hmm. Would you believe with all that British upbringing and coming into the high school, do you know most of us, most of my peers, mm -hmm. married M. Jack fellas? <laughs> that blows me away wow. after now. Right. Geddes, who became Dagger. Mm -hmm. His wife was as fair as um, Sharon Rowley, the wow. Prime Minister wife. Mm -hmm. She, her father, was a headmaster in my with my father's group. <laughs> and if my memory serves me well, I think they came to school with a chauffeur, if I'm not mistaken. Oh wow! Okay. And when I heard after leaving school, of course that. That is dagger. I said, no, 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 no. I couldn't understand it. Right. But we were radicalized. That's what I was about to say. Right. We, and hear how it began because Bishop Anstey, where it's located on Gordon Street, mm -hmm. up there near the Savannah, when you go east on Gordon Street and you're going towards Charlotte, I think it was between 
Abercrombie and, and Frederick. Mm -hmm. There was a house there. Can't remember if it was the Henry's or whatever. We used to go there when school finished at 2.30 to meet some of the fellas who would then become the NJAC, the real NJAC oh. um, pioneers. Mm -hmm. And it was there they used to give us literature. We in our uniform, eh? but you're right. not seeing us. We're not on the road. Right. And beside giving us the literature, they would engage us in discussion to find out what we thought of this and right. what we thought of that. So that was a major influencer coming from them because they were the form formation pioneers of the NJAG movement. movement right. Yes, because many of them live Belmont and all the different areas. Mm -hmm. and, and what was another very interesting part in Bishop, when I told you, when I described the, the big yard where now have the labs and all that, the form of transport used to be bicycles. Mm -hmm. So every school had a bicycle shed. So girls used to ride home to Belmont and wherever. I used to have to go to walk down to South Key, to where is now City Gate, right. to get the train. And right. I had my best friend who lived in Tanapuna. Right. So we would ride the train together. So I'm putting all of this fast to keep the context and the, the listeners walking with me. Right. So the influence with Black Power came from the guys themselves. And then... We, you have the daddy and Miss Shirlan doing the little thing quietly, but not calling race. Right. But just exposing us and what daddy did. I remember this as a little child. I think I must have been about six. Mm -hmm. He would put me on his shoulder to go to Woodford Square to hear Eric Williams, to hear Marian Anderson, to hear, and I didn't know at the time, um, Robeson. Paul Robeson, okay. who was the biggest radical revolutionary of the time, and he was a, a, a baritone singer. By the way, my dad sang as well. He had oh, an okay. a cappella group. Good? Nice. So he made it, this was where and I mentioned it earlier, about how eclectic he was, mm -hmm. where he laid down the ground rules in raising us. He made it very clear. This is what my mama told us after. All his children had to go to college. What we call in college now as university, we just knew it as high school. Right. All his children had to go there and university after accordingly. Because the university of the day was UE. You didn't right. study about no foreign. That mm. was really mixed at all. Right. Also, he was very clear we all had to do music. Mm. That combined because we had a piano mm -hmm. and every house we lived in had a study. So we grew up always seeing shelves of books. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how warm my heart feels when I look at um, MSNBC and CNN at night, now that the world has gone virtual. Right. And I see all the guest speakers that they Absolutely. invite. Right. These books, me, I say, watch, right. man. <laughs> you know? Because I, I have mean, friends. Yeah. I mean, if I was, you could find the camera, we'd see <laughs> all your life on the side right there, you know? But, well, that is the little, little. That one have just tapes. That right. is what I tape. But my library in my living room, you know, with right. my books. Mm -hmm. Because books create an ambiance. Mm -hmm. They create an atmosphere that there's an energy there. You know, and so when I look on at the guest speakers and I say, man, like, I'm, and they don't have to be professors or so, but everybody have their books behind. Right. Because the reading is what helps with the communication and what was also very significant. And I, I, I don't know how I forgot this part. Mm -hmm. When I was now in big school, form one, form two, mm -hmm. you had your playtime in August vacation. Right. And then when school would resume in September, from the middle of August, all play now start to go down now. You have to get a clean out. Right. You know the clean out? <laughs> whether it's salt, whether it's, um, are you saying centipod? Centipod, right. Yes. Or yes. 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 One of the three or all three. Mm -hmm. Also, we all had to cover our books yes. with brown paper. Right. And label them. Right. And I went to that as well. That's why I'm telling you we are historians. Mm -hmm. And also, with me, mm -hmm. when mama is in the kitchen on a Saturday baking bread, I used to have to read my literature books to her before the school opened, before the, the term began. Mm -hmm. But 
not just the school books. Before I went to the big school, when I was still in junior school, I used to have to read to her the Aesop's fairy tales, Enid Blyton, wow. who were authors of series of children books. That's right. And I'm saying this to say, mm. while I'm reading that to her, who, mm. while she's needing bread, she will stop me every so often and ask me a question mm-hmm. to know if I'm understanding what I'm reading. Wow. Which was Please now voice. called comprehension right. and syntax. Mm-hmm. Because you know there are people that just read like a parrot. Yeah. Just and I am so focused yeah. on the pronunciation and whatever. Now daddy is outside in the living room doing whatever. Mm-hmm. And when I am finished and maybe walking out and whatever, he will call me. He said, um, I heard you mention a word. Now you ain't know where he coming from, eh? <laughs> because he was a genius at listening. Mm-hmm. You know, they have a lot of us. I don't do it good yet either. <laughs> While somebody is speaking, you processing what you're going to tell them. Right, right. You're not listening. Yeah, you just wait. You're not listening. You're, 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 follow? Mm-hmm. You're, you're ready to jump in. Daddy mm-hmm. will listen. And he said, um, there was a statement you said while you were um, reading. And you mentioned the word epitome. I can't remember that, of course, because I was maybe answering a question to Mama mm-hmm. or focusing. He said it's spelt epitome, but it's pronounced epitome. I say, okay. <laughs> That's what I miss him for. Mm. Because he was the, he used to, because his style of communication is not just the written, mm. but the oral. It was two words I remember distinctly he corrected me on. And when I said Ori, he said the word is Ari. <laughs> A-W-R-Y is spelled right. Ori, mm-hmm. but it's pronounced Ari. Wow. And he ain't talking loud. He's not embarrassing here. Right. And of course, when we hear us now, Lyman with our friends from up the street and whatever. Right. And we talking now, Rango, Rango. Right. He wouldn't interfere. He would interfere. He would just say Merle. That is my mother's name, Merle. Or oh, after all my time investing in his children, <laughs> you hear what they say. <laughs> you can't but, understand what. <laughs> but that's that's an important point, though. It's very important. You got the the formalities from the British yes, influence, yes, but yes. you still had the country influence of your peers, and the, so that that was good. Yeah, the best of both worlds. I would say. And then he would play music he, on records, he had long time LPs. Mm-hmm. He would play like classical. He would play opera. We never had jazz. Mm-hmm. The earliest jazz or R&B, soul, soul, was on the radio, which had two stations. Right. That is Red Fusion, and then you went on to radio. Mm-hmm. Good cloth, cloth feast. Mm-hmm. And I only fill in that into let you know my musical influence. Yes. Good? And that's where it began, in the house. And then on a Saturday when you're doing your chores, you did it to music. Mm-hmm. When you're cleaning out, mm-hmm. you know. And, and my brother would teach me the dances. You know, <laughs> putting my foot on his foot. and Because he, he like, he's the dancer boy. Yeah, that's, 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 I mean, I guess most <laughs> kids would have gone through that step on my Of course, dances. of course, you so know. Now, so now you, you have, have gone through the, 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 the stage. High school. Right. Yeah. And now you're going into the woman now who has, you know, to spare, you know, steer her life in a certain course. What would have been some of the bigger influences then in certain All right. Time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I left school at 19. Mm-hmm. And um, I started, my brother um, said there was an, um, a vacancies at Liat mm-hmm. at the time in 1971 and that I should apply for one. So he found out all the groundwork, brought the form, and I did that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I did the interview. I was successful. So I started working mm-hmm. two weeks, let me see, two weeks after leaving school. Yeah, oh. two weeks. That is um, August from 1971. I was in school. I don't, I don't even think I got results yet from A-level. 
Right, it just went straight into... Just went straight in, mm -hmm. you know. And um, the world of work now, okay, so you have the influence of the Black, because with the Black Power influence, even though I didn't march and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are, I just wore simple clothes, but not African printed clothes. Right. You know, but just always, always very simple. And it was... I had an Afro from in Bishops, from in 69. I had the, the Afro. And um, when my mother said she nearly collapsed because when I was a baby, I was born bald, right, totally right. bald. And I was even up to the age of three. I didn't have hair. So she used to cry at night and study what happened to this child. And a lady told her to just keep brushing the, brushing the scalp. <laughs> <laughs> and the hair will grow and eventually I think I was going in four and I just had like three little sprigs and she used to tie a ribbon on it so that was my first ribbon right. so right. can you imagine well, I didn't know all of this because I was little so it's only when I cut it off she was like you have any idea oh. what it took to grow your hair <laughs> and this is what <laughs> And it's my sister doing it there with her shears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's just dropping on the ground. So that was a major thing for her. Mm -hmm. But she didn't say it from the standpoint of I want to be black and all of that. Right. So it's important that that too was a shift that I made. I was the first one in the family to have gone that way. Oh, and from in school. Wow, okay. The youngest. But, yeah, and I remained the only one in my family with a natural up until maybe 20 to 20 years ago when one other sister went natural, you yeah. know. But yeah. all the others, I tell you, the rules of engagement, mm -hmm. the first step, they were, you know, you must have your hair straightened right. or press and, you know. Right. And, um, but coming on to that now, and I'm at work, in the world of work, we had a wonderful relationship in the office. You know, I ended up being in accounts as an accounts. I never liked maths, still don't like maths. Yeah, do never I. wanted study because <laughs> the readings that we were reading, remember the literature that I told you the guys used mm -hmm. to give us and we read. Mm -hmm. You know, I am I I knew about CLR James. Because in school, I missed this part. Before we left, the vice principal asked who wanted to study what. This came from since in our choice of our choice of subjects mm -hmm. for A level. Mm -hmm. And who wanted to do medicine? Who wanted to do this? And when they came to me, I would always say, I don't have anything. But, and they would be like, you have to have something. Wow. That you want to study and from since then eh, i said I, I i can't think of anything right i just want to be you know i go and work and whatever but right good right but at that time the anti-university wasn't as strong as when i got to be reading and especially when clr james made the statement that um tertiary education is more costlier education than higher education and I said, you know, how I imbibed that was to mean if I read enough, because my father was self-educated, eh? remember they didn't have university in their day, he came out right. of colonial. Right. So he just had a teacher's exam that he sat, but he always read. Mm -hmm. So I just said, if I could do like him and read sufficiently and enough, why I need a university, you right. know? And I always had in mind that some of a significant amount of persons who go to university come out very uppity, mm. you know, and they have this air of um, I have arrived. Right. And to me, that is like a fictitious point, you know. And uh, another little intervention that I overlooked, you remember I said as number nine, I was always left alone and the others coupled. Yes. So what, where I made my joy and entertainment, when, then, when they would go liming and I'm at home, mm -hmm. I would teach my dolls and I would line them off in the study right. and teach in spectacles right. and teach them different subjects. I wasn't in high school yet. I right. was in the junior part. Right. And then I would set um, exams for them, tests, 
<laughs> and I would write the test eh, in right. different handwriting. <laughs> And speak and cajole and right. I mean now I look back and I have to say parents really are masters, you know. Listen. That's why Oprah Winfrey said that is the hardest role to ever be, you know. Oh, because man. my parents never looked at me that I was mad or dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> I was really talking to myself, eh? right? Yeah, indeed. And then impersonating mm -hmm. different characters. Mm -hmm. And then I would allocate Saturday mornings to mark the papers. Some getting plenty wrong. <laughs> because I was fear. I was right. being balanced. Everybody can't pass everything. Right. And I am like, way, but I never thought of, I don't think yet they had black dolls. So all oh, my okay. dolls were British, okay, okay, like, okay, like okay, those okay. were seen, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that because look at now I'm teaching. Exactly. So from since they I'm seeing daddy and mm -hmm. what daddy used to do, they used to have inspection of schools and he would take me. So and he would go all down in central and south. I got to know places in Trinidad. Right. And so I'm building on all those influences. Mm -hmm. So going to Little Carib with Beryl McBurney, I didn't know all of these were radical black people, mm -hmm. revolutionary black people who every name that i called had forged a road they had to make the road that they were passing on right right you got it mm -hmm. but i was up on his shoulders you know mm -hmm. but everybody had it rough to, to cut through the morass and, right. and, and establish who they were so coming out of that and then another thing although he didn't play mass he his whole being was carnival Mm. So you never see him drunk and drink and carry on or whatever, but he never missed a juve and I with him, eh? Yeah. And I was little. Right. So when the jab jab come, the real jab jab, not right. the one with dance skin. I talking about real jab jab and come right up in the face and, and take out the teeth. They would have like dentures or something. Right. Then, you know, my bladder just gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember him just holding my heart. He used to put his hand to see me. <laughs> my heart found him coming out. Wow. But he didn't miss carnival, even though not as a masquerade. One of his okay. brothers died from carnival because he always played um, characters. Oh, okay. And he would um, paint his whole body in like, either silver or gold. Okay. And one of the carnivals apparently went into his paws. Oh, and like how you get lead poisoning, right, yeah. Right, Ellis, right. Ellis. So, none of us know that brother mm -hmm. because he died from um carnival, right. you know. But daddy, as I tell you, he was this silent powerhouse, right? Right, with the readings, we were never curious to know what he read. Mm -hmm. He was also a Freemason, a grandmaster, the Lord. We don't know what that is, right? We never asked. And it's only as an adult, because you're now asking me now in the adult years. Eh? Mm -hmm. So I'm not yet there. I'm now a young adult, now right. late school, and I now start working. So I'm right. now familiarizing now myself with the world of work mm -hmm. in the art. And then in comes, this was, I started in August. I think it was October of that year. I met who would become and who I thought would become my life companion. That's where we met. Oh, he was in the revenue. Me. He was in the revenue department and I was in the expendable department. Oh, okay. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, he would send messages by one of the guys working in the unit. Right. At little notes and um, whatever. And that one was real miserable, eh? The one who I worked with. <laughs> right, you're the messenger. Oh, Lord, and I say, what wrong with this red man? Because he was, you know, right. he was tall with a big fro, eh? Right. And um, I was always not cautious. No, cautious is the word. Cautious of just not seeing a brother as a brother. Not because you're wearing a fro. I used to see her as a brother. Right, I got you. I had my own little quirks and dogmas, which I came to realize were dogmas, mm -hmm. where I would try to be fitting people into certain roles. Mm -hmm. 
So having entered the world of work in August of 71, and then meeting Gregory, was his name, in, by October of 71. Well, it is alleged that many women um, choose men who are similar to their fathers. It is, it is very alleged. much, yes. Mm -hmm. It is alleged, you know. And um, what a lot of people don't know, and at a biological level, the chromosomes from the father goes to the girl. Mm. So when people believe, or what Tom say, that the men influence the sons, no, they influence the daughters. Okay. And the mothers influence the sons. Mm -hmm. See? And so you have to understand that between the X and the Y chromosome. I got to know that more again when I became a student of, of the tree. Right. Um, so up comes Gregory, who will not enter Valentine's, kissy, kissy, your eyes are this, I love your smile. No. Right. He was fresh off the block of Enjack. Oh. Fresh. He's a radical himself. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. No small talk. Mm. She say, he say, them say, what say, no. And what did he start off with? Well, we chat and whatever, but he started off with literature. Uh, and he too would, so he pick up where I left off from in Bishops. Mm, and I already liked reading. Right. But the television had been already introduced. Television came in around 1962. 62, 63, good? And not many people had a TV in their right. house, and it was black and white. Right. And so in the six, late 60s, six early 70s, in the radical movement, which started with the, with the Black Panthers and all of them, we used to look at the TV as the boob tube. Okay. That was our title for it. And also, what the, the, the kind of movies that were shown, predominantly white, of course, whether they were westerns, detective, comedy, right. predominantly white actors. Good? So yeah, it was only Sidney Potty, I think, was the first that made a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So even though I had started off looking at the TV when we did get one, because in those days, they used to go by the neighbor who had one or all who had a TV in the, the street. You would go by their house to right. see a few movies. So when I started in black literature now, and what was different though with Gregory, that was not where he started. Because at that time, you recognize the demise and we use it guardedly right. of what we thought would have been the revolution that didn't happen. So there was a void. I wouldn't call demise. Demise is death. There was a void. And in the black community, in the black um, diaspora, and in the blacks in the Caribbean, and in Trinidad and Tobago, where we, with all the marches and so on, whatever, and it had reached this point of when well, state of emergency and whatever, and the curfew, there was this lull period as if symbolic of a time for reflection. Right, okay. And it was at that time, because I never remembered having a discussion with daddy about what is this going on? What is black power and thing? I only got my information through the literature that the guys would bring to us right. in school. From school. But um, now, here is Gregory, who I am living in Barataria, which is still considered country to people who from tongue okay <laughs> would you believe mm -hmm. so he's a woodbrook he was a st jamesian right so sour real far <laughs> <laughs> but he never looked at it in any demeaning way because the first time his group from Enjak knew sour in the truest sense was when basil davidson got um, Basil Davis got killed mm -hmm. and his funeral was on Sawo Hill. So the march mm -hmm. was from town to Sawo. So they must find it was very far because they marched. <laughs> they didn't drive. <laughs> but that was a big one because they didn't know where they were going. Right. They just knew they were paying homage and respect to Basil. Right. Okay. Gregory comes in and he didn't start he, it, the, 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 the core thing mm -hmm. was pure discussion. It had no, we go in cinema, 
we go in here, we go into a set, we go in, no. That's not how it started. And he would take me sometimes to St. James when it would have um, drumology. Mm-hmm. Um, they still have it. The, mm-hmm. I forget the name of the group. Um, I remember it just now. The drummers. And um, of course, you're traveling by taxi and so on to go. Mm-hmm. My parents took umbrage. Not my parents so much. Mama was always the quiet one when it comes to these rules and protocols. Daddy is the man of the house. Right. Who is this man with a big, big afro? That Jenny seemed to be mesmerized and looking up in his face as if, well, whatever he says, manna from heaven. Right. I am saying this in my words, but mm-hmm. that bothering them now. I don't know all of this happening, but you know, they would just ask occasionally in this, where is he from? Mm-hmm. Because again, all my other older siblings, before they left to get married or whatever. Daddy, any anybody who's dating, background check. Mm. Background check was the password, was the um, relevance to acceptance. Mm-hmm. So they have to know not just your parents, your your district, your church, wow. your 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 whole way of being. Right. Now. That don't leave them. No. You you still in my house mm-hmm. under my roof. You're not paying rent. And if even you were, you're still under my roof. Right. So once you're here, you abide. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, I had to give you that joke too, because the courting home, all lights on, you're in the living room either with them or you're in the gallery. <laughs> with the light on. Right. It have no dark corner, forget right. it. <laughs> so when Greg and the same obtained where Gregory lived now, we he had moved from St. James now to Woodbrook to his grandmother. Okay. And she was the matriarch of her house, of course. And the same obtained with her. You don't have doors closed. You know, you hear children saying, I'm in my, why are you in my room? Right. To the parent. Ah, you not even thinking of going there now. Because you don't own anything, you are you are cust- not even custodian. You are under my roof, mm-hmm. and so they had an issue with that. And then, as Gregory, we get no, no he affected my mind clearly, which is where I'm getting the stimulus. Mm-hmm. So the stimulus is not one of eroticism, right, or sexually rotten. No, right. he was a fine-looking right. guy anyway, right, but. My caution came from that because I was like, you don't look like somebody that would want a me okay. with my little country self, with my little and a darker than you, mm-hmm. you know, and, but I didn't understand him at that point, but I was just going on the optic and you from tongue, I don't know that culture yeah. and you may not know mine because we live very simply and, you know, in a communal way. Mm-hmm. But what I came to realize after is that because of his broken home, his, mo- his mom and dad separated, you know, and he saw when he visited by me, that family, that familial oh, okay. wrong then. So it was that too. Yeah, that would have been a that drew him. attraction to him, right? Right. You know, and to see the matrix then. Mm-hmm. That I came from, so that was what drew him. So he used to see me like this little angel, and I, I well, you know, everybody know me for smiling. So mm-hmm. he used to call me Smiley too. Mm-hmm. But whenever he would walk me down from Sanjet House down to get my taxi, and so and eventually started accompanying me in the taxi based on where the discussion was, mm-hmm. there was always discussion or conversation, mm-hmm. and whatever I read, he would ask me my opinion on on it. Right. You got it? Yes. So I never got chocolates and roses for Valentine's Day. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I didn't get a specific birthday gift. Mm-hmm. He would give me, they used to have a group of, uh, a little group there in Duke Street, right between um, Abercrombie and St. Vincent called the Pine Toppers mm-hmm. with Martino and um, Tuse and all of them. Right. And they used to make cards. And Gregory would always buy the cards, fascinating cards. I have all of them, you know. 
with like you know resistance and 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 but not resistance in a hateful way right but just always would give affirmations and sayings like one had a glass a piece of cut glass in, in when you open the card mm -hmm. and it would just say the woman in and you mean the mirror is you you know very simple words mm -hmm. but very profound so I have all those cards, you know, but it, there was never anything fluffy. So when he met me, I used to use very light makeup, eyeliner, no blush or anything, mm -hmm. but just eyeliner. And he would ask me about it, you know, why I do that. And I say, well, for highlight. Yeah. And say, well, what your highlight? <laughs> and I used to be so self-opinated. Right. You know, I would be like, well, I like, I, I, I am, a, you met me doing it right. and I don't see it a problem. You know, the attitude that going with it because you're home. Maybe. He would just be quietly waiting mm -hmm. and you will never give him a monosyllable answer if he asks anything. If you just tell him no, yes, he said, well, elaborate. Mm -hmm. And he had a patience. He would wait until it till get it dark yeah. and then you, until you break through. Wow. This song yeah. I look like it that though. Auntie that, you see, that's because <laughs> right. when daddy said no, it was no. Mm -hmm. And the discipline, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that gradually, and when the you know, heat started building up with them asking about him and his afro, why doesn't he cut his hair? And da -da 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 -da. I say, Greg, you know what? You don't come here. I will come visit you because I ain't able. Just, right. and I did that in two, you know. Right. And eventually, well, it, 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 I, I loved, I loved the, 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 the discussion. I loved where he took me, you know, he would take me like the players mm. and the new, ah, and that's when he started introducing me to different genres of music. Mm. You follow? He would play it by him. He had a partner living in the annex there, and that's when, like Booker T, and you're getting in now to R and B, right. and you're going in now to the jazz. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know jazz then at, at before at all, okay. you know. But when I got when I listened to the music, it was like man, you know, because there are some people off the back will just tell you, no, 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 I can't handle this, you know. Mm -hmm. Give me lyrics and whatever. So right. he was the one that influenced me. So whether it was Afro, whether it was American, whatever, but the jazz is a black music, you know. Interestingly, he moved me from not just black literature. The black literature wasn't just black literature. He moved me more gradually into philosophical literature. Mm. So that, you know, because of what they thought at the time during this lull that the revolution had failed or it didn't go the way they wanted. Mm -hmm. He graduated himself into that there must be something more mm -hmm. effect change. That was where he started, you know. There must be something more. And in his search, he came up upon the Vedanta, which is from the Vedas, and Yoga. Uh. And that's when he started bringing the literature from there now to me. Mm -hmm. Beside reading, whether it is on feminism, whether it was socialism, whether it was Marxism, all of those were the genres we read. Right. And even though at the time when I was attracted to uh, Marx, some of Marx literature, and I, and I wanted that, those um, books were banned during the Black Power. Oh, they were? All, yeah, yeah, you couldn't go and just buy the literature in town. No, we couldn't. And so, then we studied that in school and for sociology and thing when I was doing A-levels, you see? You see? Yeah. No, we couldn't. We only had the Eric Williams and the CLR and whatever that were here. Yeah. But right. once, it, once it became very radical and bordering on the socialism, communism, right. and Mao Zedong books and all of that. So I remember daddy was going up to England. And I asked him if he could get some of these books for me as an elder, you right. know, and, and he, he was able to bring them in, but not in a big quantity. Right. You, know, you just had to prioritize. Well, I remember in all these things as I'm speaking it now, you know, right. so much that we take for granted now, mm -hmm. you know, and there were bookstores. If you wanted, you could order, but some of them, no, totally negative list, negative right. list. Right. 
And so that's where my library began being built, built up, you know, and through the reading. And then because he got more entrenched in the yoga mm-hmm. and the, um, the Hatha yoga, which is the, um, the exercise part and so, and he then said, well, you know what, this would, this would have been about 1972, late 72, that he would go to India. And uh, I say, well, why? And he say, well, you know, he, he needs an ashram, you know, because the literature really kind of goads you in that direction. Right. Where you want to experience that aspect of the thing, if you're really going to it enough sufficiently. Right, right. And so when he came up with that idea, I said, well, okay, if you go there, because by this time, I was influenced to the point after reading Gibran, Khalil Gibran and all these people, right. I went vegan, which then was just known as vegetarian. Right. So my diet had changed. I was not looking at very much TV, mm-hmm. the boob tube. Right. I was reading more. And so that was like my parents wondering what going on. So my brothers now start asking, what going on with you? Oh. You know, you ain't the you that we know. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, no, I'm good, you know, thing, thing. But they know who is the influencer. Mm, okay. So even though he's not visiting, then even though he's not present, yeah. they know I'm clearly going that route. Mm-hmm. And... When um, 1973 came, I say, well, you know, it would have been nearing the time, Gregory. He had already bought the suitcase and what apparel he needed, just one suitcase, and he would go. He, he didn't know for sure where he would be, but he going. And um, I then said, you know what? It doesn't make sense having reached that far in my shift that clearly I had made mm-hmm. in terms of how I behave, my lifestyle. Right. To put that pressure on my mom, because they used to tell me I eating like a bird, and you know, things like that. Right. Derogatory as it may, might have been, I mm. didn't want that to think that she had to cook separately for me. And, Understood. And, no. So I moved, I decided, you know what, I am going to be on my own. So you decided and to fly the coop? I decided this is, you know, it was such a clear decision. Mm-hmm. Now, how to do it? Well, I look back and it looked like, and clearly I could understand why my father said, you have to be mad. Because mm-hmm. I did ask them, that I told them I wanted to speak with them mm-hmm. and I'd let them know something. So they thought I was coming to tell them I was going to get married. Mm-hmm. And when I came home from school, I told them, no, I am going on my own and I'll be living on my own because my lifestyle has changed, and it was cataclysmic. Wow. Because that has never happened, not under his watch. Mm. And a girl child, the last one, Mm -hmm. who I didn't know at the time, he had put aside money for to study medicine. Oh, okay. Didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I am now Mm anti-university. Radical in a quiet way change of life so where his i think what what they were worried about was whether i was going into a cult because oh. they used to have Ma- maharishi yoga people walking in saffron right yes at the malas at the time so he might they might have been and understandably so mm-hmm. but the hormonal push the internal push is that di- all i can describe it as is a dynamic right there was a pull from the influence around and there was a push Mm -hmm. and it turned out that that night not by design that i told mentioned it was august the 30th the day before independence and daddy always went to the parade to see them at the savannah right and after the response was so traumatic you know for both mama just kind of froze and the apartment that I got in El Socorro didn't have electricity in yet. Okay. It had water. I didn't have, I think I had only a, a bed in it. Okay. I didn't have things in it yet. Mm-hmm. So when I made the announcement, I thought I would make a month's advance notice. But it turned out that I left the next day. Wow. 
Yeah, I just woke up the next day and told my sister, I say, look, I got to go. Good. She felt like frozen. I say, yeah, I had to make this move. Wow. Up to now, I can't describe to anybody. What? It's like you're walking on water. Mm-hmm. You just know you have to do this. And it's not wrong. Yeah. But you're so sorry mm-hmm. to see them in this pain. It clearly but, was pain. But you still have to make your move. But I had to do it. I, I just know I had to do it. Yeah. And well, I will now say the rest is history because I did make the move. And that's where I met now your father. Yeah. Because after living there for some years, they came in later. On um, Todd Street. In Todd Street, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I started there with one thing at a time, buying one thing a month. Right. But- and then Gregory Chain, um, India was going through a lot of. Um, pollution in the Ganges and they, oh, they had a kind of outbreak of a lot of communicable illnesses. Mm-hmm. So when he went to get something from the Indian High Commission, they told him now was not a good time mm-hmm. to travel. And there is when he asked me, and I was already living on my own for about seven or eight months. Mm-hmm. When, the, when no lights are six o'clock in the evening, I'll go out and watch the stars and then go back inside. And um, he moved in about eight months to almost a year after, you know and we just had a little radio and the the rest and he built up and we were both working in Liat Mm -hmm. and then when Liat changed to 1974 limited when we thought it was closing down I moved out into another um, office and he left you know Mm because many of many of the workers were retrenched wow so so Auntie Jenny I really what I, I watch in I watch in time, but yeah. I also I also um know that this story is so deep and so rich, yeah. right? That I don't want to miss anything. You wanna do a part two? I feel we may have to consider doing a part two. Because you know? was, this was really the bedrock. Yeah, this is of, this is essentially you have to know it. Yeah, this is essentially part yeah. one. I think this is a really, really good spot to sure. probably consider doing our part two on this. Yeah. and get the full just because the story goes even deeper yeah because you will know now the major influence gregory was mm-hmm. and the outcome of that liaison right essentially that, to lead up that to essentially where led me to you know where you are no and to where i am <laughs> so that part will let us call part one the gestation nice and then we would now see the the, the um bloom the bloom that's it, that's it. So this was beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to take a, take a moment. This would be the end of part one, gestation period. And we now look forward to part two, The Bloom, with our beautiful Auntie Jennifer Rouse. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Rouse. That's right. You'll always be my son, son, because I know you in liquid form. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Right? So Correct. We look forward again. Thank you so much, Auntie yeah, Jenny, for making the time. And it's we will organize like... for part two. And this yes. is, I am so excited about it. No, Have sir. a wonderful rest of your beautiful day. And um, we look forward to our part two. Thank you so much. <laughs> <A> pleasure. Take care. <laughs> Take care.